professor. She's been here about 10 years. It's actually 11 because I have her 10-year awardee in my office, so congratulations on that again. <laughs> and uh, she's going to be talking about uh, brain concussions. That's what our area of expertise and research is about. She's going to talk about that not just as sports related, but how it affects us as people and professionals and um, how it can help you in your world. So take it away. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to kind of talk about traumatic brain injury and, and more specifically concussion and really look out at it outside of um, just sports, which is where I primarily spend most of my time. Um, so we're going to kind of just talk a little bit about how big the problem is and why it is such a concern um, if you follow sports. Um, ESPN on a daily basis almost has something about concussion with the pending NFL lawsuits and everything else that's going on. But we're going to talk about who's affected, because that 5 to 19 year old age range where we typically see a lot of sport related concussion is a very small group um, where we have traumatic brain injuries and concussions. We're going to define what it is, because interestingly, there are still a lot of misconceptions about what this injury actually is, even among healthcare providers. And there are some uh, pretty good survey research and other qualitative research that has looked at different healthcare providers and um, their knowledge and awareness and understanding of concussion, um, and it is lacking in a lot of different areas. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how a concussion is managed. And when we get to that section, I'm going to segue a little bit more to focus on the sports because that's where a lot of our evidence is. But regardless of whether the concussion is a five year old who falls on the playground, or a high school athlete, or a 60 year old who falls while trying to get out of the bathtub. The same types of assessments are often used and the same types of management strategies are, are often used just scaled to that specific population. And then I'm going to end talking a little bit about what we do within our ATSU concussion program because I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of the services that we offer and the work that we do in the community and the types of research that um, we do and some of our, our collaborations. So, it's really the silent epidemic. One of the things that a lot of patients struggle with when they have a brain injury is that the outward signs and symptoms aren't really there. If you tear your ACL and you're in a big bulky brace, everyone sees you and they're sympathetic to that you have an injury. Um, and so there's this awareness. But most of the people with traumatic brain injuries actually look quite normal. And in a, on a global sense, they function quite normal. The problem is it happens a lot, and a lot of these injuries are what we consider mild traumatic brain injuries or concussions, and the way that those manifest are, are in, in very subtle ways in some regards. We know that there's about uh, a brain injury every 23 seconds, and uh, surprisingly, brain injuries are eight times more likely than breast cancer and 34 times more likely than HIV and AIDS. So it is a significant problem. And if we look at just some other general conditions, this is from some of the CDC data, um, we definitely see that the annual incidence of concussion is higher than a lot of other conditions that I think have a lot more attention paid to them. So if we look strictly in Arizona, this is from the Arizona Department of Health Services. We have about 1,300 deaths annually from TBI, um, about 7,000 hospitalizations, uh, close to 50,000 ED visits. But the bigger concern are those who are not receiving any care. And for a lot of these individuals, it's simply because they don't know that they had a TBI. Maybe they were in an ATV accident, maybe they had a sports injury, they fell off their bike, they feel a little dazed, ding, bell rung, all of those things that we hear to describe this injury, those are, are actually concussions. So many of them seek no care. When we kind of look on this spectrum of brain injury, what we're really talking about is a, is a subset of mild TBIs. And I tend to use the word interchangeably because I do a lot of work out with schools and young athletes. And I don't want to downplay the severity of the injury by saying it's something different. So we tend to, to use those words uh, synonymously and interchangeably that a concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. Typically with these injuries, um, most of the sports injuries that we see, their Glasgow Coma Scale score is 15. Um, in some rare cases, we'll see it 14, but typically we don't see anything lower than that. So uh, they're, they're neurologically intact for the most part. They just have a lot of the um, signs and symptoms that we'll talk about in a little bit that tends to delay their recovery. So who are the folks at risk? Um, our younger kids, zero to four, a lot of that is falls, playground equipment. Um, unfortunately, we see TBI from shaken baby syndrome. Um, and then our older group, the geriatric population, a lot of the fall prevention, the balance training, um, 
TBI is a, is a result of, of some of those imbalances. So there's definitely some added, added bonus to working with those individuals. And then that 15 to 19 year old group, uh, which is kind of a, a mix of the sport concussion and then some of the risky behaviors. And in Arizona, we see a lot of TBIs um, from um, ATV uh, riding in particular um, is one of the, the higher kind of recreational activities, I guess you could say. Uh, we also don't have motorcycle helmet laws within this state, and we see a lot of individuals, um, including, unfortunately, students riding their bicycles to this campus who do not wear helmets. And those are all um, you know, potential uh, causes for injury. So in addition to what um, uh, I already hit on, uh, we can see TBIs from firearm accidents, near drowning, uh, being struck by or falling against objects. And then we kind of have our, our non-traumatic causes of brain injury. Um, a lot of times these are classified as our acquired brain injury from stroke, aneurysm, and other um, mechanisms. The military is also an area where we are starting to, not necessarily starting, but are, are doing a, a fair amount of work. I just rolled off as a uh, board of director for the Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona, and the largest issue that we've dealt with in the last five years have been the returning vets and them coming back with undiagnosed TBI, uh, families complaining of behavioral changes, um, concerns with just their, their um, self-control, uh, memory, um, and we know from um, the, those coming back from um, Afghanistan and Iraq that they're estimating up to 20% of military personnel has probably suffered a TBI during their deployment. Most of them were not aware and did not seek combat. And one of the things that's interesting about the military now is they've actually taken kind of the sports model of TBI assessment where pre-deployment they do cognitive and balance assessments when they go out to the field. Uh, if there is a case where they have a, a blast injury primarily, they assess them back there, and then when they return stateside, they assess them again. So this kind of whole baseline post-injury model that we use in the sports world has really translated into the military. Uh, about 60% wounded with IEDs, uh, motor vehicle accidents or falls, ended up being diagnosed with TBI. And the, the other stat that I think makes this a little bit more important is that in previous uh, wars, the survival rate from TBI has been really low, but we're doing such a better job that our um, mortality rate is going down from implement, uh, explosive devices and such, but now we're seeing the remnants of the brain injury because they can stop the bleeding in the field, they can um, treat a lot of those other traumatic issues in the field, but that TBI is still left over. In the sports world, um, we see a, a number of concussions annually. Um, these are, are data from different uh, registries and national databases, looking at the numbers presenting primarily to the emergency department. If we look, um, again, we're concerned about those who don't report to the ED. Um, and if we look across um, kind of nationally, they estimate uh, anywhere from about two to four million sport-related concussions annually. Um, and they account for about 9% of all high school athletic injuries. We know that there's somewhere between 7 and 8 million um, children who participate in high school athletics, so it is a significant problem there. With the sport-related injuries, um, everyone seems to talk about football, and while football tends to have the highest rate of concussions, girls soccer, girls basketball, and cheerleading are probably the next three down the list. And I think a lot of times the girls sports kind of get pushed and everyone focuses on football. So I think it's important if you have children participating in any of these sports that you're at least aware that there is a, a significant risk factor for concussion. The other thing that compounds this besides the number of cases that we see annually are recognition problems. And there's been a lot of work done looking at medical professionals and their ability to understand concussion and um, evaluate it. Uh, coaches, athletes, and parents are also groups and, and some of our alums um, have participated in research surveying these groups. So there's a lot of misconceptions. People don't necessarily know what it is or what it isn't and that makes the whole reporting component uh, even more difficult. So what is this injury? I'm going to play this video. This is from a Cal game a couple of uh, years ago. I can't see my... There we go. 
And this is pretty apparent when he hits. He hits kind of his back and his neck. He's posturing on field. Um, we obviously know that something is wrong um, and potentially something more significant than a concussion. But the classic definition that's used by the American Academy of Neurology is really a trauma-induced alteration in mental status that may or may not involve loss of consciousness. And seeing some of the signs associated with the injury is one of the key areas in which we use to diagnose the injury. Uh, he, he actually uh, was out for a couple of weeks um, and then returned. And um, interestingly, one of our alums was the athletic trainer for Cal at the time. Um, so we had a lot of conversations with him about that particular injury. Um, this vid next video I think is nice because it tends to show this whole split desktop thing. There we go. Um, and this is video is actually from the educational piece that all um, at high school athletes within Arizona are mandated to watch. But we typically see a collision that results in some kind of shearing force that's directed at the brain. And the brain moves inside the cranium. And while we don't see any structural injury to the brain itself, we see that there are stretchings and, in some cases, shearings of some of the axons, which tends to slow the transmission. And when we educate athletes, we say, a lot of times you're going to feel like you were at like a DSL connection, and now you're back to a dial-up. Everything is processing really slow. So the other thing that's important to know are these features of concussion, because I think this better defines what we're talking about. Um, the, I think the first thing is that it's an impulsive force that's transmitted to the head. So the impact itself does not have to occur uh, to the head directly. It could be something to the body that causes a whiplash mechanism that can result in the concussion. Um, it, symptoms and uh, other signs typically start in a rapid fashion, but they are short-lived. There may be some neuropathologic changes, but it is a functional disturbance rather than a structural injury. And this is an area where, again, when we start to talk about um, best practices in medical personnel, a lot of times we will see athletes who come to us from the ER and they say, oh, no, there was no concussion because their CT scan was negative. The CT scan is going to be negative. Our current imaging is not adequate to actually identify anything because it's a functional, in, uh, functional injury rather than something that's going to show up on any of those imaging. We are starting to see some work, though, where they're using functional MRI, where they're actually doing cognitive tests within the scanner and looking at how um, the um, functional changes. And I think that might have some promise, but we're not there yet um, as, a, as a, either a diagnostic tool or a measure of recovery. And then we have a gradient of clinical symptom, symptoms that typically resolve in a sequential course somewhere between 7 and 10 days post-injury. But in some cases, we may see that symptoms are prolonged, and there are kind of a series of comorbid factors that may delay recovery. For example, uh, children tend to take longer to recover. Um, those who may have attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder, learning disabilities, those with a prior history of concussion, um, those are all things that we look at because they tend to have a prolonged recovery. The problem is that we don't see the injury. In this particular case, he has a dislocated ankle and his foot is completely opposite of his other foot. This is really easy for us to understand that there's a problem on the field. <laughs> we see hits like this all the time. But there's no sign that really indicates to us whether or not this individual may or may have not sustained a concussion. And interestingly, a lot of the work currently being done with accelerometers in the helmets, looking at biomechanics, has failed to identify a threshold. Some people can take a really, really, really hard hit, absolutely nothing. Others, very minor hit, all the symptoms tend to come. So there's not this magic threshold that we can identify that would allow us to say, oh, you just took a hard hit, you need to sit out, you didn't, you're okay to go back in. Uh, I don't want to get into this, this too much, but when we start to talk about the functional nature of the in injury, um, there are neurometabolic um, things that go on where we tend to see an uh, efflux of uh, potassium, an influx of calcium, 
um, the sort of metabolic rate for glucose increases, so the brain wants more glucose, but the cerebral blood flow actually decreases, so it can't get the glucose that it, we need, that it needs, and that causes um, so, some significant problems within the first initial days post-injury. And all of this tends to subside somewhere about one, one week post-injury. But what it leaves us with is kind of this, this period of vulnerability where there's a mismatch between the demand for glucose um, indicated in the red line and then the metabolic rate for oxygen in the blue. And when we start hearing about not letting kids go back to play, taking time off of work after a TBI, it's really to allow the brain time to heal in this initial stages. There are a couple of concerns with a secondary blow to the head happening during that time right after that first concussion while the brain is still kind of in this um, chaotic uh, period. And this, I think, is highlighted with some of the data from the NCAA study. This was a study that was done in many um, NCAA institutions back in the early 2000s. And what they tended to note was that the first week after the concussion is what they called the critical first week. Because when they started to look at athletes who sustained a concussion and then had a repeat injury, 75% of those happened within the first week and 92 within the first day. And I think that's where you start to hear a lot of the, well, you've had a concussion, you need to be out for a week came from there. We've now kind of changed our tune a little bit. Everything is managed on an individual basis uh, currently, but we're still very cautious about what happens initially uh, following injury. The other primary concern is with children um, and something called second impact syndrome. And this is where they receive a uh, second blow, not necessarily to the head. Um, it could be just a typical tackle in their sport that results in a, in a loss of autoregulation in the brain um, where we start to see an increase in intracranial pressure and that leads to herniation uh, through the foramen magnum, pressure put on the brainstem, and eventually brainstem failure. This sequence of events happens within minutes after the second hit. So even if there's EMS on the sideline, we can't stop this from happening. Um, the problem with this is that there's about a 50% mortality rate and a 100% morbidity rate. So this is kind of the big elephant in the room when we start to talk about concussion legislation um, that is passed in all states but Mississippi currently and why we're so cautious with younger people once they have uh, any type of head injury. We're also concerned with repeat injuries because once you've had a concussion, you are more susceptible to another. Um, and there are uh, several studies. This is from the NCAA data, and it's almost a dose-response relationship. So the more prior injuries you've had, the more likely you are to have another. Now, the question we often get is, what about loss of consciousness? Because if you think back to a lot of the concussion grading scales from back in the 80s and early 90s, there was always this question that the severity of the concussion was based off the presence of loss of consciousness. All right. Anyone see my little arrow? It's going. There we go. So this is a typical soccer injury. Two players going up and hitting heads. Uh, the player in the white has lost consciousness. He's down for the count on the field. This, again, is one where it's very easy to recognize. And unfortunately, there are still people that will say it's not a concussion because they did not lose consciousness, which is a, a pretty significant misconception. If you look across multiple studies, less than 10% of athletes who have a concussion demonstrate loss of consciousness. So 90% of the cases, we don't have this clear cut um, way to determine whether or not they've, they've had the injury. What's also interesting is that loss of consciousness does not imply severity or predict recovery. I've seen athletes who have lost consciousness for five to 10 seconds. They look and f tell us and feel completely fine the next day. I've seen other athletes who do not lose consciousness. It looks like a simple minor hit and they have symptoms for three weeks. So there's no rules really when you start to look at some of these initial presentations. 
Loss of consciousness is also not associated um, with number of symptoms at follow-up exams, not predictive of neurocognitive deficits, and not associated with um, neuro, uh, neuroimaging or electrophysiologic abnormalities. So again, we're always concerned if we see someone with loss of consciousness, whether it's from sports or motor vehicle accidents, and usually we will have them imaged to rule out a more serious injury. Um, but when we're looking at it from trying to predict recovery, it makes it very difficult. So after the injury, what happens? Well, we have a number of clinical symptoms. We tend to see cognitive impairments, balance impairments, and then in those cases where individuals have a prolonged recovery, um, they might have some physical concerns, problems with returning back to work. Um, in the younger individuals, we see a lot of school issues, where they might need academic accommodations in the classroom. Um, and then there's also the psychosocial concerns. You've probably heard of all the cases of uh, Junior Seau, Andre Waters, um, former NFL athletes who have committed suicide, many of them purposefully not shooting themselves in the head so that their brain could be studied. Um, and so there's those concerns um, that there might be some long-term issues, and I'll talk about that briefly. If we look at symptoms, this is kind of one of those take-home things to know, and on the handouts, for those of you um, that grabbed one, there are a list of concussion-related symptoms, and for all the educational pieces, this is what we focus on, being able to recognize these types of symptoms so that individuals who have the concussion or have any of those symptoms can report it to a, an adult or a healthcare provider. And we typically um, kind of classify these into the, uh, symptoms related more to cognition, to sleep, uh, the vestibular somatic, and then those that are um, what we consider affective or more emotional in nature. Um, interestingly, the two groups on the left, the cognitive and the somatic symptoms, are the ones we tend to see more immediately after the injury, with the affective and the sleep arousal symptoms maybe not showing up till four or five days post-injury. So you may see someone who tells you initially they've had a headache, the headache subsided, they're feeling okay, but then three days later, now they're irritable, they're sleeping more often, and they have um, another, a number of other issues. So we usually manage these types of injuries with daily follow-ups um, to really look at how symptoms are changing over time. And this is just depicting a lot of the other issues that we have in areas where we just need to be cognizant. Um, in many cases of TBI, there might be kind of some social concerns. They don't feel like hanging out with their friends. They, don't, they feel a little um, kind of out from their normal peer group. They have emotional issues, fatigue, uh, mood issues, anxiety, depression. Um, and, and these can all significantly impact their recovery. What makes this also a little bit more difficult is when we talk about our military patients is that there is a lot of overlap between symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and TBI. So we know that a lot of these service men, are come, men and women are coming back um, with you know, PTSD as well as potential TBI symptoms, and those are hard to tease out in many cases. Um, and uh, th I think the two of them combined uh, which probably happens in a lot of cases, again, makes recovery difficult. Now, we evaluate these injuries in a number of different ways. Almost all of my videos are pretty um, obvious concussions. This was Scotty McCarty in Kitzbühel a few years back. Um, another example of losing consciousness. And so again, seeing something like that, you're kind of on high alert for something more significant than a concussion, at minimum a concussion. He's convulsing slightly. Um, but we have a number of other domains that we need to evaluate because most of our cases don't look like that. They walk off the sideline and they feel fine, or they've been in a car accident and they go home and they you know, maybe feel a little fatigued, but there's not these major complaints that we tend to see. So we evaluate all of these clinical domains um, and it's beyond the scope of, of this talk, but if you are interested in how we do that, I would definitely be happy to share some of our tools with you. Um, but we do a thorough clinical neuro exam. We use um, graded symptom scales and other symptom inventories. Our mental status tools, we have one specific to the sports arena. The CDC has one called the, the ACE, the Acute Concussion Evaluation, that is good for clinic use. Um, 
Uh, we do uh, vestibular ocular testing as part of our exam. Uh, we evaluate postural control, uh, and we can do some more complex neurocognitive assessments, either via computer or face-to-face uh, -face, uh, paper and pencil batteries. And then the results of these tests at the initial evaluation as well as the follow-up evaluations will dictate how we're going to treat the injury. And our treatment and rehabilitation, for the most part, has kind of been this area that's been lacking because the current recommendations are rest, rest, and more rest. Physical rest and cognitive rest, where the, if we're talking of a sport concussion, they don't participate in sports, they don't do physical education classes. Um, in some, uh, from a cognitive rest standpoint, and this is very <coughs> difficult with high school athletes, but um, don't text, don't IM, stay off your computer, don't read. In some cases, we institute academic adjustments in the classroom, as well as have them miss school for a day, of a day or two to let those symptoms subside. Because if you think about it, what do you do if you sprain your ankle? You put ice on it, you elevate it, compression, you rest it. How do you rest your brain? That's really hard to do. And so we try to mod make modifications um, the best that we can. So from an academic accommodation standpoint, this is from the Zurich Consensus document. We want to try and limit exertion, scholastic, and cognitive stressors. And this is really done on a continuum. On the left side, we kind of have this no cognitive activity. And then on the right side, we'd have kind of full activity where they're back in school. And for each patient at each day post-injury, we have to slide them somewhere on the scale to a level that is tolerable and doesn't exacerbate their symptoms. So this can't be done in a vacuum. This is where we work with school nurses, guidance counselors, teachers um, at the school. We can use the same cognitive rest theory in the work environment if we're talking about adults where you know, maybe you're, you're, if you have a, a more active job, you're on desk duty for a while um, and just really trying to limit what you're doing. Uh, this is the CDC ACE. It's, it's probably a little blurry. The CDC has uh, wonderful information. If you go to cdc.gov slash concussion, um, they have educational toolkits available for youth coaches, high school coaches, healthcare providers, and school personnel. Um, they have free downloads of absolutely everything. They have posters and videos, um, and they are, uh, you can put an order in and get a lot of this information. We get the fact sheets and distribute those to our schools. But this is from their healthcare provider toolkit, and it's a nice sheet um, that can be used along uh, in, in your practice with return to activity suggestions, return to school suggestions as well. We've done some work looking at the accommodation standpoint. We've developed a survey instrument called the Backpack, um, and uh, one of our uh, soon-to-be graduates surveyed athletic trainers. We're also in the process of sur surveying primary health care providers, school nurses, and guidance counselors. And one of the, the interesting that, things that we've noted is that about 80% of athletic trainers have personally dealt with a concussed student athlete who's needed academic accommodations. And so I think it's a lot more prevalent than we originally anticipated. And when we talk about interprofessional collaboration in this area, we're working a lot with the schools um, and making sure that, that information is communicated because all of these student athletes, their primary job is to be a student. Uh, and this is some of their, the CDC information, which is, is fabulous. The other area, has really been kind of this concept of, of physical activity and rehabilitation. This is from a uh, retrospective chart review that looked at high school and collegiate concussed athletes. And what they found were that those groups that were at the end of the spectrum, either they were withheld from everything or they went back too early, had the worst outcomes. Not surprisingly, everything in moderation these individuals who were allowed to do school activity and allowed to do some light activity at home had the best outcome across the board. And so one of the problems, especially when we talk about athletes, is they're highly motivated. The last thing a football player wants to hear is, you can't play, you can't do anything, you can't even be on the sideline with your team because that'll increase your symptoms. So the other area where we're starting to see some good research um, is in this area of active rehabilitation where we know exercise has a positive effect on mental well-being. 
and a closely monitored rehab program can actually be beneficial to improving recovery times. And Isabel Gagnon is a physical therapist in Montreal who's done a lot of work with youth athletes. Um, and this is actually starting to show some promise. Uh, John Letty and his group at Buffalo have also done um, some kind of uh, sub-symptom exercise training, and that has been beneficial as well. Vestibular rehabilitation is another area that is showing promise. This is actually from one study looking at um, a vestibular intervention in concussed athletes. Um, but they found that the intervention itself was actually uh, beneficial on almost every single outcome measure that they evaluated. And this is something that we're actually going to start to look at um, with our audiology PT and AT programs this coming fall with uh, some of the local high school athletes. And then dual task strategies where we're doing cognitive and balance activities together is also another way um, that, that people are starting to look at actually doing something that's more treatment as opposed to just indicating rest. Now the big concern is if this management piece isn't done right, we might have these long-term consequences. And these are just some of the ones I'm sure I, I probably missed some up here. But um, there are some studies of NFL players that show an association between prior concussions and depression prior concussions and early onset mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we need to be concerned with post-concussion syndrome, which is when symptoms continue past three months post-injury. Um, CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is the condition that they're finding in some deceased athletes where there's a buildup of tau protein um, and thinking that that is causing some of the erratic behavior of these individuals before they pass. We also see behavior changes um, not to the extent that it causes suicide, but some significant behavior changes and then alterations in academic performance. The management piece is also important because when we talk about sport concussion, we talk about return to play. If we talk about uh, older individuals, just return to their, their active lifestyle or um, you know, adults with returning to work, this is an important piece. And we don't just kind of rush into it. Um, and Within the sports world, we follow a, a pretty well-established, graded return to play progression. And I would suggest that this can be modeled for a return to work program, um, where we walk through a, a series of about five to six steps, about 24 hours apart, that are really um, intended to um, increase the, the demands on the body, uh, going from light aerobic activity to sport-specific exercise. For example, with football linemen, we have them do a lot of up-downs because they're constantly going down into a three-point stance and coming up, and that can increase dizziness. So we want to make sure that before we clear them to return, we're mimicking everything they're going to do in a game situation. And I think the other important piece for all healthcare providers to know is that most states, except for Mississippi currently, have concussion legislation. And all of these bills have several um, commonalities, including typically some type of education that has to be done, informed consent, removal from play, and return to play. And I spent um, an afternoon with our PA students um, about two weeks ago, and I said, this is probably the only illness or injury that you're ever going to manage that's governed by a state law. So you better know that state law in the state that you're practicing in, uh, because that's going to be important. So all of the states have uh, except, again, for Mississippi, have some type of uh, current legislation. It's important to know what that is. Um, and this is from an analysis. We, we've updated it since. Uh, this was at a time when we had 44 states that had passed legislation. But several states um, have the educational component, and most of them are for the coaches. They want to make sure that the coaches are aware of what a concussion is. But some states mandate education for athletic trainers and physicians. So um, I can get a list of, of which states, but it's important to know because if you're a physician, you'd probably need to know which state, if, if you're working with athletes at all, um, that you need to be educated. The other area that regards healthcare providers is return to play. In all of the states, an MD or a DO can provide clearance for a return to play. And then the list of providers really varies uh, depending on the state law. In Arizona, 
It is uh, MD, DO, physician assistant, athletic trainer, and nurse practitioner who can provide clearance to an athlete. So if you're talking to your students, um, this is, again is something that's important to know. So a couple of other key things, um, since Tanya only gave me an hour. I, could, I teach a 12-hour class on this to our athletic training students, so I could talk about this for a long time. Um, I think we need to be aware that concussion occurs in all sports and outside of sports. Loss of consciousness is important, but it's not a key indicator. Uh, grading scales are not useful. Uh, recommendations to uh, abandon grading scales were made in 2001, so we're now 12 years out. And unfortunately, I've seen things come back from providers that say, here's a grade two concussion. Like, really? <laughs> um, so again, it, it, it's important to note that neuroimaging is not beneficial to diagnose recovery or determine when someone is ready to return to work or play. Once you have a concussion, you may be more prone to more injuries. Kids take longer to recover. Equipment cannot prevent concussion. And this, as a, as a parent or a consumer, helmets, mouth guards, headbands, none of that stuff has been shown to be preventative. Um, so mouth guards are, are perfect for doing what they're supposed to be doing, reducing the risk of dental and oral facial injuries, but they're not going to prevent concussion. And some of the uh, fancy football helmets that now sell for about $1,000 a piece um, are not better than ones that are a lot cheaper. Um, so you just need to be cautious there. It's not strictly a physical injury. We see a lot of behavioral issues associated with it as well. And then rest is probably good until symptoms clear, followed by an active recovery uh, is the way that, that uh, things tend to be looking right now. In about a minute, I'm going to talk about what we do. Um, our athletic training uh, concussion program is really uh, focuses both on education and research. Uh, we do research in the following areas. We look at knowledge and education of many groups. We evaluate the psychometrics and measurement properties of various assessment tools for concussion. And then we are prospectively evaluating um, a number of different, different factors. We've really tried to look at quality of life and the academic side post-injury. Uh, we have done preseason baseline testing for probably close to 11,000 local Arizona high school athletes, and we're tracking close to 500 um, concussions post-injury. We track them out to day 30. Um, and like I mentioned, this fall we're starting the vestibular rehab uh, study with audiology and PT. We're also involved in the Barrow Concussion Network, and you'll probably hear more about this uh, as the football season ramps up, because I know um, uh, both institutions are looking to do uh, some media push with this. Barrow Brain Book is the education piece. If you have high school athletes, they need to do this. It is an online course that's about 40 minutes, and they have to pass a post-injury test in order to be eligible to play high school sports in our state. We have developed a concussion research registry. We provide cognitive, uh, computerized cognitive testing for most of the high schools within Arizona. And we have a concussion consultation feature that is meant to bring healthcare providers across the state together to uh, make sure that everyone is evaluated on the same playing field. And we're using the OnePass medical community uh, Barrow has been the primary driver uh, for this piece, but it allows healthcare providers to request consults with concussion experts in the Phoenix area. And uh, they can kind of get in additional information uh, uh, to help make decisions about their athletes. Um, anyone affiliated with the university can become part of the network, so if you're interested in just kind of being around the social environment with these physicians, um, it, it's kind of a nice opportunity and you can contact me as well. The last project that we're working on um, is a collaboration between TGen, uh, again Barrow St. Joe's, ASU, and the university, and we are going to be studying um, the ASU football team this entire season, uh, looking at helmet accelerometers and evaluating head impacts during games and practices. Uh, we're going to be taking blood saliva and urine and looking at biomarkers pre and post season. Um, 
as well as um, those individuals who have a concussion, who sustain high magnitude hits, or who have high frequency impacts. And we'll be correlating that with all of our clinical measures of cognition, balance, and symptoms. So it's a, quite an undertaking, but um, a good collaborative endeavor um, that we're embarking on. And there's always apps for this. Uh, if you go to the, I store, to the uh, Apple store and look for uh, concussion apps, there are ones for medical providers that include the symptom scales and things. There's one for parents that are great for educating and even kind of running you through a little quiz to determine whether or not your child might have a concussion so you know to seek additional uh, medical care. So there's uh, definitely a lot out there. And that's all I have, so I will open it up for questions if anyone has any. Yeah? You mentioned some of the aspects of uh, psychosomes and psychosocial. Has there, are there studies, and does that overlap? I think yes, you would have. Uh, brain injuries in terms of causality. This Or not with the overlap between PTSD and TBI in the military and the psychosocial factors, um, the, the, is there anything to show causality? And unfortunately, no, not causalities. There's some studies that show um, a greater association between those who have a diagnosed TBI and PTSD with certain psychosocial factors. Um, the ability to tease those two out it has been kind of the dilemma that everyone's facing. Um, they tend to focus, um, because there's those common symptoms, they tend to focus on those outside symptoms, the flashbacks, um, you know, as being more associated with PTSD. Um, but that's been the biggest problem. The other issue with the military that we tend to run into is um, the stigma of a TBI and just the general personality types of those service members. Um, you know, it doesn't look like anything's wrong, so they don't necessarily think that anything's wrong. And they're not seeking treatments um, or seeking additional evaluations. And I think the system's not necessarily uh, being an advocate for them to kind of direct them into, the, into certain areas. I know the BIAAZ does um, some support groups with military folks. Again, the question was if there's alternative therapies. Um, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that hyperbaric oxygen therapy could be beneficial, but the other area where I think we're starting to see more things is mindful-based training, um, really trying to look at stress reduction and more of those techniques. I haven't seen a lot out there looking at, at say, acupuncture or more physical um, other modalities, um, but the, the mindful-based stress reduction type things tend to um, show good promise um, in, in other TBI literature. They haven't necessarily translated um, to anything with sports yet, but. This is a silly little question, but when you go back to the overlapping domains of things for right brain injury and post traumatic you've got flashbacks and recurring phenomena. What's the difference? That's a good question. And that's not my, my not my area of expertise, okay. but yeah, yeah, there must be something, yeah, yeah. Oh sure, um, I did a presentation for one of the research colloquia seminars. I don't know, it was a year or two back, and I had some folks in the dental clinic that came over, and they said, oh, so when we see these kids in the dental clinic who, you know, got hit in the mouth with a baseball, and they're coming to us uh, because they, they fractured a tooth or they have an issue, we should probably be evaluating them for concussion. And I hadn't really thought of it that way, but I'm like, yeah, you probably should. And um, something like the ACE um, is a very easy kind of a tool um, that kind of walks you through at least what types of questions you should be asking the patient as far as symptoms he or she might be having. 
but I think a lot of times we sometimes get really focused on what our area is that we might miss that big picture. And I thought that was a, a very good statement when they brought that up. All right. Well, Thanks. Thank you very much.